News Radio 840 WHAS. Good Sunday morning. Bob Sekoler and the Louisville Real Estate Show here with you till the top of the hour. Thanks for joining us with us for this show. Brad Lawler, owner of Home Team Inspection Service. They come in as a team, and as we've told you in the past week or so, they are now the number one Home Team Inspection Service team in the country, eight years in a row. Also here with us, Kevin Disler, representing Pitt & Frank Attorneys. You can pick the attorney that you want, and Pitt & Frank's a great group to, to uh, pick. You can reach Kevin and his team at 895-9900. And if you'd like to talk about selling your home, we can help you. It's a simple matter of picking up a phone, calling me. We can talk on the phone. You can talk with me via Zoom. I can come out free, no obligation. We can come up with a plan. You can reach me anytime on my cell phone, uh, even right after this show, 376 376- Five four eight three. That's three seven six five four eight three. A quick note, uh, gentlemen and ladies, uh, you may have heard already. This past Wednesday, the Fed increased short-term interest rates by a twenty-five basis point, which is basically a quarter of a point. So it continues, uh, though there are signs that that may slow down or stop or go the other way a little later on this year. So that's all good news for anybody who's tied to the short-term interest rates and those of. Though they say it doesn't, it, there somehow it affects long-term mortgage rates. So that's why we track it so carefully. We're doing our Zoom show. So if you have a question, send me an email, bob at com, And then send the, in the subject line what the question, the radio question. And then basically just send me the question in the body of the uh, email. And I will answer it as we will on the air. And also a reminder, if you want to schedule to see homes, want to talk about or look at homes in the Louisville area, go to WeSellLouisville.com. That's the main website for us, WeSellLouisville.com. Okay, enough of the plugs. Here we go with some questions. Let's start with, uh, Kevin, yourself here. Dolores, buying a condo, and it currently does not have a garbage disposal. The Condo Association says you can't have a disposal because the plumbing has an issue. So, Brad, pay attention. Mm -hmm. The condo association says you can't have a disposal because pl the condo complex plumbing has an issue. Only people who already have a disposal mm -hmm. can have one. And when those old ones go out, they're not allowed to re be replaced. So, all of this because of plumbing. So, Dolores says, why? Asking the condo association, but no answer. So, Kev, let's start. Well, let's, let's do this. Let's start with Brad. Is this... Having a disposal will affect the plumbing. Explain this to us. Oh, yes, it will. So the thing about a, a disposal is people will dump anything down the disposal, think that it goes away. Well, any of the fats that you have, any of the greases that you pour down your drain, all that's doing is coating your, your drain lines. So what I will tell you uh, from personal experience is that anytime you put anything down a uh, garbage disposal, make sure you run a lot of water particularly things like, you know, lettuce cores or broccoli stems, uh, eggshells are terrible. Uh, they will clog up your your pipes very quickly. Uh, so the, the trick is run lots and lots of water after you put anything down a uh, disposal. But how does that, so it stays in the, it, the plumbing yeah, line? It, it, yeah, it'll yeah. it'll stick to the right. the pipes. It'll get clogged up, and you just create a uh, a backup situation. So I had the, to I had yeah. actually put in a special clean out just for my disposal because of the it got clogged in the same spot before it got to the main line, oh. and I got tired of trying to go through the uh, the sink. So I just put a uh, a clean out in the basement that I have to go into periodically to oh. uh, pull the clog out. Does did the condo older condos have that a more serious problem? Is that why the condo association isn't allowing them? I, I would I would speculate that because they are connected to each other, that the problem you know created in one unit is being moved downstream to the other unit, you know, containing other you know other places right. to a clog. Is my guess. I I don't know for for a fact. All right. So now we got the basis, but here, Kevin, we bring you back in from the legal standpoint. If some people in the condo association have it already, is it fair for Dolores not to be able to have a, a disposal? Well, that's one of the, the, the questions is it, you know, Brad had mentioned that a lot of these places will have old piping. And when you buy a condominium, it's usually, and all of them are a little bit different, but from the drywall in, you as the condo owner own that and are responsible for it. Drywall out of the unit is usually the responsibility of the condo association. So if you have a problem with the plumbing, the bill would tend to go to the condo association they have the right to rule and make rules and govern the condo, and they can come up with new rules as facts present themselves. So in this case, mm. I'm assuming the condo 
kept paying for a lot of repairs. So they adopted this rule. And the reason why if I have one, I can continue to use it. I'm grandfathered in. I had a, now I'm speculating here, but I had a garbage disposal 20 years ago when there was no rule against it. So how can you, after I have done that, mm-hmm. pass a rule retroactively to make what I've done against the condo rules? So in that case, you're, you're okay to continue using what you have. It's just when it goes out, they won't allow you to replace it. Because again, even though that's your unit and you want to do with your unit what you want, it affects the plumbing throughout. And like I said, if it's an older unit, you have some of the piping that's getting clogged up. Some of those bills can be quite significant. So it's the burden of that. So if you choose to have a garbage disposal, all of a sudden the bills for you having that, your choice, are borne by all your neighbors. And they've decided as a group, board members, to decide to adopt that policy. So in, in unless I'm missing something, they, they probably do have the right to do exactly what they've done. All right. Hopefully that answered your question. No, I think you, you answered a question. Incidentally, a little later on in the show, nine cleaning mistakes that were actually making our home dirtier. That should be rather interesting. We go over to Brad. Joel sent us an email asking us about an article that he read. He says, closet lights, the article says closet lights can start fires. He specifically pointed uh, this question at you, Brett, saying that he read where a 60-watt light bulb can get as uh, hot enough to start a fire in a closet. He's asking, when you're inspecting homes, do you see a lot of light bulbs that are not covered that could cause this problem? And is it, it really a serious problem? Uh, you know, I'm not familiar with a fire that's been caused by a light bulb, but I can tell you, having replaced a few of those light fixtures myself that's run yeah. incandescent bulbs, there is tremendous heat that builds up. Uh, the 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 foil liner um, in them can be very brittle uh, when you take it down, so I can definitely see a situation where you'd have a lot of heat. Now, is it hot enough to actually start uh, building materials on fire? I don't know. That, that might be uh, difficult. The other side of it is, though, with everybody kind of switching over to LED bulbs, those run significantly cooler. So even if you have an older fixture, you switch from an incandescent bulb, you know, putting off tremendous heat to an LED bulb, putting off nearly no heat, uh, that would be one way to uh, to lower the temperature and reduce the uh, the problem. I would think you would have more of a, of a problem with electrical connections arcing and sparking uh, in an old fixture than you would a problem with the uh, light bulb itself. But, you know, they do put off a lot of heat. Uh, you still uh, inspectors I'm talking about in general will write up a light bulb that's not enclosed in some sort of housing. Am I right about that? Um, no, typically not. Oh. Um, no. Now, if there's anything that looks like it's a safety um, hazard, then we will. Uh, but if it's not an imminent uh, safety uh, situation, it's not going to it's not going to make because, you know, a lot of lights are 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 open anyway. It's just how they're designed. So, okay. you know, we don't have any any say over how they're uh, they're manufacturing, what they actually look like. We move on. By the way, you can sign up for our free bi-monthly video updates. You can go to WeSellLouisville.tv. That's WeSellLouisville.tv. Those are our video updates that we send out twice a month. Back over to you, Kevin. Uh, Diana bought a condo, wanted to replace the carpet on the floor. We're on the condo kick, you notice. Mm. Carpet on the floor wanted to be replaced. The condo association said no, because it would make noise if installed. Not the actual act of installation on the floors, but walking on the floors. And so Diana went ahead and installed the floors anyway, she says. And the condo association went after her. They told her to remove the floors. She applied and was fined because it was in the bylaws, no wood floors. Do we see a lot of condo associations where they say no wood floors? Because if you walk on it, the person below you is going to hear it. That's I guess that's, that's relatively new to me, but I, you can see the justification if, if the original developer had carpet uh, yeah, right. to, to increase the noise. And again, if you're in a condominium on the first floor, you're I, I could see the issue and the, the reason for it. Um, but I've never come across. I have not seen that one, but I can, I can yeah. see the justification for it. I guess the but the past two questions here from uh, on the condos. Before you purchase a condo, be sure that you review covenants, conditions, restrictions to make sure that there's not something in the bylaws that would prevent you from doing something that you thought you would be able to do, right? Well, in her stories, you know, uh, you, when you when you move into a condo, you pretty much accept the fact that you don't have free reign to do with your unit 
what you would like. You're subject to rules that you don't have complete control over. And I would suggest that you sit down and look over all the bylaws and talk to some residents and just determine there's some of us that have personality types that just are not well suited for that. We had, I had one case early in my career where someone moved into a neighborhood and he didn't like the mailbox and providing the neighborhood had the same mailbox. Uh-huh. And I think he got fined and had to pay attorney fees. And uh, ultimately, whether his opinion of the mailbox, whether it was hideous or not, which quite frankly, I agreed, <laughs> nevertheless, you subject yourself to the rules of the majority and you either need to abide by those or probably put a sign in your yard. All right, we we move on. Uh, ben has heard us talk on the radio about the humidity of a home there, Brad. Mm-hmm. He has a humidity monitor, good for him, we do too, mm-hmm. in his bedroom that shows the humidity at 41%. Mm-hmm. He heard that there are some benefits of having a humidifier in the bedroom to raise the humidity upwards of 55%, at least during the wintertime. Winter. Ben says he knows you're not a doctor, but does humidity <laughs> or humidifier in the bedroom help the bedroom and the house and Ben himself, a person? Uh, okay, lots lots of parts of that. Um, so does it help him personally? You know, he'll have to be the judge of that. I know that uh, at times I've run a humidifier in bedrooms, you know, particularly if you're not feeling all that great. Uh, maybe it helps with uh, with some of your your head congestion. Uh-huh. Uh, but as far as the home goes, you know, the humidity level in your home will vary depending on the outside temperature. So right now where we are dealing with, you know, colder temperatures last week, it's warming up a little bit, you know, today. But what you'll have is the colder temperatures, you're going to have drier air. And that's really when, you know, homes are, are looking for a little bit extra humidity. That's when you're getting a lot of static and those things, you know, the humidity level in your home is pretty low. That's that's when you get the the itchy skin and, the you know, the, the other, you know, problems that come with low humidity. And in the summertime, you know, your air conditioner, when you're running it, it's actually taking moisture out of the air. That's what these, um, uh, the condensate lines are for. That's why you see, you know, water coming out maybe the side of your house uh, w- when you're running during the uh, summer because you're reducing the humidity in the air. And in the summertime, you know, you, wintertime, you may have 30, 35 percent humidity in your house. Summertime, you pr- you want to stay below 60 uh, percent humidity. Uh, the comfort range is really probably that 40 to 50 percent range. And again, I, I know there's I don't know that that's necessarily health, you know, benefits from having that balanced humidity. But I know that, you know, you're you probably have a little bit easier time breathing and certainly probably less static and sparks and, you know, dry skin to deal with when you've got that right you balance. Know, he, hit, he hit on something, Kevin. Let me think just real quickly. So I get cracked heels on my feet and I got to put some sort of cream on it. To, th- this is a direct cause of the humidity in the house, right? Well, yeah, very possibly. I mean, you think about, huh. you, know, you know, the dry air that we have outside, you know, when, wow. when it's cold, I mean, your hands dry out and crack and cuticles and everything else. That's the, that's lower humidity. Well, Brad, yes. I just had this problem personally, I guess, with my place. And is there a difference between gas heat and electric heat? They're mentioning that when you go from the heat pump to the heat yes. strips, it really yeah. causes the humidity to decrease. Is that yes, correct? Yes, it does. That's, that is correct. Yes. Because the heat strips are, are pure electric. You know, that's just like running a toaster or a blow dryer. So that is, you know, that is basically 0% um, humidity going on around those. So you're you're kind of drying the air out. The heat pump is actually part of the air conditioning system, just essentially running in reverse. So you get a little bit more of a benefit on the humidity side there. But yeah, you'll notice a big difference when the auxiliary or the emergency heat kicks in. Um, your your air definitely dries out. If you have gas heat, it should be kinder to your skin, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know that it's necessarily kinder uh, to your skin, but it's uh, it's. I, I think I don't see the extremes um, with gas that you do with with heat pumps and then the emergency heat kicking in. Right. Well, you, you see, I saw some indication they were talking about in the future about you know gas heat versus electric heat about doing things to basically not necessarily make it illegal, but giving you a lot of. Mm-hmm credits in order to go to the the electric heat but yeah. it's you almost need to have a humid, humidifier don't you uh yeah i think so i mean i i do in my house and i'm on i'm on gas heat but uh i just have a whole house humidifier you know uh i think a lot of the systems do the yeah i think you're right kevin i think I'll, you talked to any of the hvac guys right now and they're all looking at the future uh of hvac uh, of heat in particular being heat pumps and there's some very high tech heat pumps that are coming out. Um, so, you know, it'll, it will be interesting to see if homes start converting from, you know, gas to electric, but that's what I'm being told is going to happen in the, uh, in the future. All right, let's move on coming up in just a minute after the break, nine cleaning mistakes that you're making your home dirtier. A reminder, 
you can uh, see what the people are saying about us. We're really proud of our reviews. And let's face it, that's what we're all about, trying to uh, do the best job possible. You can go to LouisvilleZillow.com or LouisvilleGoogle.com dot com and see uh, the reviews on our show we're taking the break uh with us kevin disler pitt and frank attorneys 895-9900 also brad lawler owner of home team inspection service and you can reach brad and his team at 844-411-team and you can reach me bob sicola anytime day or night give me a buzz on my cell phone 3765483 that's 3765483 we're back in a moment on news radio 840 whas news radio 840 whas the louisville real estate show here with you till the top of the hour thank you barbara corcoran we're going to see you in a couple of month or so uh still with us and we thank them for being here brad Lawler, owner of home team inspection service they come in as a team they do a great job 844-411-team also kevin disler representing pitt and frank attorneys you can reach Kevin and the folks over at Pitt and Frank at 895-9900. Yes, you can pick the attorney you want to close your home loan, and I would highly recommend the folks at Pitt and Frank Attorneys. And you can reach me. If you're thinking about selling your home, I can talk to you about it on the phone via Zoom or come out in person free of charge. We just talk about it, come up with a plan either this year, next year, or beyond. You can reach me directly on my cell phone, 376 5483 That's 376 5483 Nine cleaning mistakes that are actually making our house dirtier. So jump in here if you all know this. Only running water and dish soap to clean your garbage disposal. We were talking about this <laughs> earlier. Water and soap won't fix everything. You need to thoroughly clean the garbage disposal to avoid mold and buildup. You run ice cubes mm -hmm. while cold water is running. Ice cubes, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Then cut up a lemon. I guess when you're done using it, you can just put it in there, run it through, gets rid of the grime. Rubbing carpet fibers uh, to remove a stain. You do this when you actually open when you I guess when you get a stain on the carpet and you rub them to get rid of the stain. You're opening up the carpet fibers, which hold more dirt in the future spots that a rub too will appear dirtier for the life of the carpet as a result. Instead, dab a stain or use an all-purpose product and press it on it and clean it with uh, something like a microfiber cloth. Also, buying fancy cleaning items to clean stovetops. I'm guilty of this myself. The most expensive cleaning items aren't always the best. You normally have cleaning supplies at home that really are more effective than the more expensive ones. Try say try sprinkling baking soda directly onto a stove stove top and add water to activate the baking soda and then let it sit and pull it off. Overusing uh, dish detergent to clean everything. Yep, uh, it's, uh, guilty. Great uh, way of attracting grease and it's handy for cleaning as well. Uh, believe it or not, especially in the kitchen, but soaps attract dirt. That's how they clean. If you use too much dish detergent, you might be leaving dirt attracting residue behind. Also, ignoring your dishwasher. Most people think dishwashers clean themselves, but they need to be cleaned and maintained frequently. You might want to check with your manufacturer on the cleaning procedure. Using stainless polish on your, on your fridge. I'm guilty of using stainless steel polish on my fridge. The flip side of uh, stainless steel polishes on your fridge is that they leave a bright, attractive reflective finish although they really make the stainless appliance pop they smell fantastic they also attract fingerprints and pet hair how about that mm. not removing dust and dirt pile up on the fridge there's another fridge related issue it's important to remove the dust pile up i guess that's around the bottom where the condenser is and the fans yeah. and all that yeah yeah this can get unsanitary since the dust can circulate in the air in the home begin by using a vacuum cleaner attached with a long handled brush to clean the dust from the condenser coils uh, and just a couple of quickie things. Also, take a magic eraser to walls. I've seen that work really well. Yeah. And uh, don't overuse floor polish because uh, too much product can create a – you're shaking your head on that, Brad? Too much product? Yeah, it, yeah, it creates a buildup um, yeah. on the floor. Sure. I want to add one more to that, Bob. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. For anybody who's living in a home that was built before 1978, you don't want to dry dust because if you have any uh, potential of lead-based paint mm -hmm. in your home, you want to make sure that you're not – just taking a dry duster and just pushing the uh, the dust off, it gets in the air. You don't want to breathe it in. So you always want a wet dust. So some sort of a, of a, of a dusting spray is what you want to use if you live in uh, in an older home. Okay. All right. We move up. Kevin, this one, I don't know that you have a whole lot of knowledge about, but I think it's important we bring this up. Izzy has a question about a reverse mortgage. She heard us talk about reverse mortgages on the radio show a number of Weeks ago, apparently her mom has a reverse mortgage on her house, and she's wondering how does she, Izzy, 
go about buying the house, I guess, if the mom wants to sell. But really, the more institution, the mortgage institution that has a reverse mortgage, am I right, thinking that they own the home, basically, because they've given money to the mom? Well, and, and most of the time what they do is there'll be a first mortgage, and then there'll be a second mortgage on top of that. Uh -huh. So in the case that mom wants to sell it to to a daughter, you can actually get a payoff of each under, under most of the products. So you, you can do that, but there are a number of, just going back to my memory and doing some of those, some kind of bizarre, strange rules. And then the question is, like, if the loan was taken out by dad, dad passes away, mom has certain rights to stay there. So you probably need to consult with a real estate attorney to take a look at it, but you can usually do that. And in your mind, you think, well, you, you sold that to a third party. You don't own it anymore. Really, from a legal standpoint, you somewhat do. It's just subject to a first and second mortgage. And depending on how long you live determines how much the payoff of the second mortgage is. So it's kind of a, hmm. a bifurcated mortgage product. See, I don't understand uh, that whole thing the way it works, which is what worries me because I think it could be problematic for anybody in, in knowing the ins and outs of a, re a reverse mortgage, right? It, it does work well for certain people, but, yeah. you know, it's kind of a, like an annuity product where you use the, the equity in your home for the annuity. Uh, unless it's changed, it's a lot of paperwork. It's mm -hmm. pretty fee intensive, but it does work well in certain situations where that's all you've got. And uh, you have social security and you've got some medical expenses. It, it, it does work for some people. Right. It, it does have a bad name just because you don't want some stripping equity out of your mom's property. So. Yeah. Izzy, I hope that helps you. Back over to you, Brad. Poppy uh, sent us an email. She is planning on putting her home on the market next month. She says her furnace is making loud, rumbling noises. She doesn't know what to do. Why is the furnace so loud all of a sudden? Is something that needs to be fixed or does she need to hire somebody? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I don't, I don't know about a rumble. I don't know what type of furnace that would be, but I would definitely get on the phone with uh, their trusted HVAC company to uh, to come out and take a look at that. Any Anytime you got the opportunity to take care of any of the issues before you list a home for sale, you definitely want to do it. You don't want to wait and have the home inspector find issues that then you don't really have the ability to control. Uh, so you definitely want to have either an inspection done uh, before you list that home for sale. If you, if you have known issues, call the company company that you're already trusting to do service um, uh, on those on those units because you, you that's just going to uh, put doubt in everybody's mind if they come in to have a uh, an issue like that but yeah specifically what the rumbling is that's a that's a really good question give yeah. anything from fan motors on if Kevin, I, Brett, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna make a how many what percentage of your home inspections are people that are getting ready to list their property? I think it's a great idea to do that, what you just suggested. You know, it's it's interesting, Kevin. The number is increasing right now. And I think but what's happening, people are looking at trying to figure out how to protect their equity because I think they are looking at the fact that maybe they're not going to get as much uh, for their home as maybe they did two years ago. Uh, so we're having more and more calls for those, those inspections before listings or pre-listing inspections, as they're known. Uh, yeah, but I I would say in the past, you know, maybe, you know, maybe three or 4% of everything we did were pre-listing, but that number is definitely increasing. And I think it's really just people wanting to make sure they can control how those repairs are made versus, you know, that real short term, get everything fixed in order to, uh, you know, do final negotiations and sell your home. Got it. All right. Final question here. Now, remember, I'm a real estate agent. I'm not going to answer this. I think basically, Kevin, this is in your lap. Palmer is thinking about selling her home next year, but she's concerned about real estate agents. A friend of hers in another state says that her real estate agent <laughs> gave bad advice on selling the house. Palmer is wondering what recourse her friend and all buyers and sellers have if they believe that there were problems created by their real estate agent. So from an attorney, what would you say to answer Palmer's fears? Well, you know, they're, 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 they're good and bad I'm a professional attorney, so I, you know, we have a few bad apples in our our closets as well. But you know, you're particular about a couple of things. One is here's the Kentucky Real Estate Commission. Uh, if you have some complaints, there's an administrative agency with the Commonwealth of Kentucky to address your complaints. Also, agents, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, you all are required now to have you know, insurance. Oh yeah, we have, almost yeah. all the agents do have errors and emissions insurance, yes. or their broker does. We sure do. I, I'm not sure if it's mandatory, but almost everyone does. So if you have a situation of fraud or if you have a situation where it's negligent, 
Uh, there are certainly resources that you can use. And I would, Kentucky Real Estate Commission actually has a kind of an expedited process where you can have a complaint against an agent and they do have the ability where you can recoup funds. So that, that would be the first direction I would put someone in. Um, but I tell you, one of the things in the issue that comes up, we've had a lot of lawsuit um, stories about it was such a hot market the last few years. Yeah, everybody waived right. inspections and they waived appraisals and they were paying over and now they're coming back against their agent, which I think is quite unfair because most of the good professional agents I know sat down with their clients and said, listen, this is a situation. I strongly advise you to do this for your protection, but you had a lot of people that tended to ignore that in the, in the, in the quest to actually get a home. So you're seeing a lot more you saw of these that yourself quite often. I know. Yeah. You, you've, um, you're yeah, there's a lot of service. articles now. Interesting. Yeah. A lot, uh, lot more cases because why didn't you protect me by advising yeah. me to get a home inspection and so forth? Um, and one other thing I would tell, uh, Palmer it, to basically the very first thing, if you're having a problem with your real estate agent to uh, speak to the broker of the, um, the group that uh, that agent belongs to. So every uh, every company like uh, Remax, we have a broker who's in charge and is responsible for answering and can addressing concerns. And that's the first step so that hopefully that broker will be able to help your friend out to, to work things out so that there isn't a need to go any further. And, and maybe there was just a miscommunication. We are out of time. My thanks to Kevin Dissler, Pitt and Frank Attorneys, 895-9900. Great job. Also, Brad Lawler, owner of Home Team Inspection Service. And you can reach uh, Brad and his group at 844-411-TEAM. If by chance you missed some of this or you want to, to hear it again or see it, you can go to our YouTube site, to louisvilleanswers.com. That's a redirect to our YouTube channel. And if you want to reach me, you're thinking about selling now in the near future or even the next couple of years, Free of charge, call me. I'll talk to you as long as you want. Uh, also, uh, visit via Zoom or in person. Just call me, 376-5483. We are out of time. See you next Sunday on News Radio 840 WHAS.